Hola, muy buena tarde. Hello, good evening. I'm Carlos Schifra, the Innovation Director of Fundesply. Welcome to this online conference, Infancy and Advertising, an overview from the standpoint of food justice, and we'll be listening to the conference on this topic. But before, I'd like to explain that on November the 10th, we celebrated the World Day of Children's Rights, and that's why we are organizing this conference. There have also been several awareness raising campaigns regarding children's rights and food safety for infancy. And there's this campaign called that I'm not swallowing this in Catalan is no mu en paso. And it refers to advertising and the trends of advertising and how they influence infancy. And the campaign has as a goal to claim the right to receive the true information as we see in articles 24 and 20 and 17 of the children's rights we are going to refer to the advertising used by the food industry regarding the content the ingredients of many of their products that are not appropriate for infancy. And the idea is to promote also a critical standpoint among children and young people. And at Fundesfly, we always look at the different social challenges and also climate challenges that the world faces. And we already organize a conference that was focused on food with educational activities for schools and for different centers. We also organized a cycle of presentations. And before giving the floor to our speaker, to Javier Guzman, I'd just like to show you a very brief video so that you can get to know this exhibition, very interesting exhibition. to discover how we can change the world through food. Eat, act, impact. So come to the exhibition to see how we can transform the world through the way we eat. And today's conference is also within the framework of the European Union Live project that has as a goal to meet, to meet the farm to the table strategies and the Green Deal strategies. And it's very important that everybody who's attending this conference today helps as assess this conference and we're going to share a link with you so that you can give your assessment so that you can assess the content of this conference. Additionally, 
There'll be a chat where you can write your questions. You see that it says Q&A, and we will try and collect all the questions. And now I would like to introduce Javier Guzman, who has a degree in political science, and he's an environmentalist and a human rights activist, and works in the framework of international solidarity. And he's the current director of Justicia Alimentaria, Food Justice, and he has been working with Oxfam and other organizations, and it's always a pleasure to have him with us to give his speech. Welcome, Javier. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carlos, and I'd like to also thank Fundesplay for inviting me again. I will speak in Spanish. I will do my presentation for 40, 45 minutes, and then we will have some time for Q&A and discussion to share your views in favor or in against. Now, we're going to start. It's never easy to give a conference on Zoom because you can see me, but I don't see you. So, that's the way it works with Zoom, but I will try and do this the best way possible. And I would also like to thank you for being here today. We know that today the Spanish football team is playing at the World Championship. So thank you for being here with us. Before starting, I'd like to explain who we are. This is an organization, Food Justice, Justicia Alimentaria, is working in Spain and in different countries of Africa and Latin America. And we work with farmers to transform the local food systems. And we also work with the public policies and with different campaigns. And many years ago, we started a campaign on advertising for children. And we worked together with the Spanish Confederation of Consumers, with Medicos Mundi, Friends of the Earth, and many other organizations. So we're talking about about different organizations and groups that are concerned about food and the bad food health that we have in our country. And we started looking at other regulations elsewhere that are not available in our country. One of them has to do with advertising. But to speak about advertising, firstly, I'd like to go to the concept of advertising and infancy. Because today, we are at a very critical moment of a civilization right now. We have all types of problems, climate change, increase of the food prices, of the energy prices. So we are at a crossroads where we need to start transforming some things. And one of them is the food system, both regarding the climate, because 40% of greenhouse gases come from the food system, but also the energy system, because the food system, as you can see on this chart, is based on hydrocarbons, we see the transport, uh, the crop protection, fertilizers, irrigation, and so on and so forth. And without these hydrocarbons, then it won't be possible, without fossil energy, it won't be possible to continue with this system. This is a food system that's not feasible any longer, that is based on a fossil energy matrix, and this is, as I say, no longer feasible. And additionally, our food system 
has become a threat in recent years because it's a globalized system, highly globalized and highly based on processed foods. So before our diet was based on fresh food and now our food products are very processed or hyper-processed. In Spain, over 70% of what we eat is processed food, even if those products don't seem processed. Even when you think that you're eating well, the thing is that we are eating really badly and this has terrible impacts on health. I have many slides, I'll be skipping through them. I wanted to show you this because here we have some information on the Spanish food system. And this food system is collapsing because it's mainly based on exports and it exports fruits and vegetables for Europe. 30% of fruits and vegetables consumed in Europe are produced in two provinces. And then we export also pork and meat. And in Catalonia, we are exporting 87% of the uh, pork meat that is being produced and we export to countries such as China. And today, an alert was issued due to the water consumption and drought in Catalonia. And we should look at the water consumption derived from the meat industry. We have a food industry that's based on exports. And it's also based on cheap workforce, immigrants and women that have very low salaries. So it's a food system based on exports, on feed and animals and fruits and vegetables. So this is the situation we face. Additionally, all of this is already a disaster and should be changed. And there are international organizations that are promoting a change because we cannot have the pork industry, pork meat industry being one of the main problems for climate change. And it's also a problem from a health standpoint because we eat a lot of processed food and we are eating a lot of meat. Meat, for example, we eat eight times more red meat than set by the WHO requirements. And we know that a high consumption of red meat is associated with certain types of cancer. And we are also eating a lot of processed food products that have a lot of sugar. The problem is also salt and saturated fat. So... We see here that our food system is not meeting the needs of uh, health and it's devoted to exports. And now let me show you some um, details regarding the lack of population in rural areas derived from this type of food system. So we are now in a caution food zone. Food has become the first problem for public health care at a world level and also in Spain. We know that the food system is not appropriate for the world. We have many people that are hungry and there are also many people who are obese. And sometimes I like to show this photograph. We see this swimming pool in Madrid in the year 1966. And many people just think that it's a crowded swimming pool and there's not much more to say about it. However, this photograph shows people that are thin. Everybody is thin in 1966. That means that our body, the 
Wage increase has been exponential in recent years, so the population in general have started increase, increasing their weight. We see that Spain is the first country in Europe with children obesity and the third one in the OECD. And this means uh, terrible health problems. So we have created a problem that comes from processed food and the WHO says that all these diseases are now causing the collapse of many public health systems. So food is causing many problems and diseases, but a lack of good food is the main problem. We know how smoking is now recognized as a huge problem, but it, there's still very little information regarding the problems caused by a, an improper food system. In Spain, we calculate there are 90,000 deaths that could be avoided and that are associated with an unhealthy diet. An unhealthy diet is causing more problems than smoking, than alcohol, or labor risk. So, unhealthy, an unhealthy diet can is, is causing, as I say, many problems. And some of the most dangerous conditions, such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, obesity, have to do with a bad diet. And these figures, the obesity curve, is growing every year. We haven't been able to revert these indicators. And here we have the curve for overweight in Spain. And this is, has a health cost because this is a cost that needs to be paid through surgery, insulin, absenteeism, and so on and so forth. So in our country, we see that 20% of the the whole healthcare system is devoted to diseases that are associated with the diet and with a bad diet. So, there is a very interesting study that stated that the measures that have the greatest impact are the preventive measures with regard to the diet. They are the most efficient ones and also the most inexpensive ones. However, in the Western countries, we're working on solutions that are more expensive, such as surgery or giving medicines to children that have a low impact and a high cost. But of course, behind this food problem, this unhealthy diet problem, we have a very strong industry in the same way as we had in the past, the smoking lobby, we now have a lobby of the food industry and there is this contradiction between our health, the health of our children, and the benefits. Now we're changing, for example, the diet in the school canteens so that it becomes healthier. When we started with the public procurement campaign for schools and school canteens, everybody was saying that we were obsessed with offering a specific type of food. But the thing is that there were many catering companies that were feeding children at school with food that wasn't healthy. And of course, there are many vested in interests in this food industry. Here we have some more data. And one of the important aspects here is children. 
because very often we don't have the possibility to choose the type of food and in the case of children it's even worse because it's very easy to manipulate children through advertising. This slide is very interesting, and that is the perception of being overweight. We always think that there is less overweight than there really is. And when we think that our children are overweight, they're really overweight. So we tend to think that overweight is less than what it really is. So there has been a change in the diet and we have more meat, for example, and sugar and fat. The healthy, fresh food products are becoming more and more expensive, whereas the unhealthy processed products are becoming cheaper and cheaper. So they lower the income, the worse the diet, and we see double childhood obesity in the low-income families versus the high-income families. The high-income families are eating better, organic food, and so on and so forth. And it's the low-income families that have more obesity. And very often we see that they are blamed for this. But it's a social question because there has been an increase in the last 30 years of the fats and sugars and salt. We are above the recommendations of the WHO. And in this uh, figure of a few years ago, we need to see how expensive it is to pay a healthy diet. And there is a large part of the population that cannot pay for a healthy diet. We don't have enough income to eat in a healthy way. And however, eating in a healthy manner is a right. So we have a part of the population that will eat in an unhealthy manner and they will have more diseases. So based on this data, and here I have another chart, this is the map of Barcelona, and here we have the relationship between the status of the different neighborhoods and the level of diabetes too. Does this mean that in the poorer or lower income districts they don't exercise and they don't eat well? No, it's just that they cannot afford a better diet. So we need public policies that will incentivate the consumption of healthy products. And to understand this better, we need, as I say, some specific policies. The WHO says that there are four or five key policies to revert the situation. One of them has to do with the regulation of advertising for children. The other one has to do with regulating and taxes. So, the, the healthy products should be cheaper than the unhealthy products. For example, if you have a lower income population, then you have to make it easy for them to access healthy food products. And the other strategy has to do with public procurement for schools and hospitals so that healthy food is procured. And then we have to also refer to the labeling. We need a better access to healthy food and we need to receive 
information that is true and no, honest because the labeling is Uno, terrible today, it's useless, we cannot no understand it, and the children otro, are manipulated no by advertising, no and no when children go to the no supermarket, they have the uh, pressure of advertising. Children receive the greatest pressure of advertising. We're talking about 50 ads per day that can be seen by children, most of them of uh, food and drinks that are high in sugar and calories and that in some countries such as the UK or Portugal would be forbidden. So there's this pressure on children to buy the type of food products that are going to cause the most problems. And it's not just advertising on TV. There is also advertising on the internet, YouTube, and so on and so forth. So our children are receiving the impact of this type of advertising. And what do we have in Spain to defend ourselves from this? Well, it's something that's absurd, in fact but it's still que, uh, valid, sigue, sigue vigor, and it's the PAUS code that was launched in 1995 for advertising, and it's self-regulated. It was drafted by the industrial food companies. It's an ethical, voluntary code, so you may or not adhere to it. Additionally, it doesn't even take into account the difference between good, bad, or healthy and healthy food. So it doesn't differentiate between the uh, products that can be advertised and those that cannot. If it's an unhealthy product, for example, in Portugal, they passed a law a few years ago where unhealthy products cannot be advertised. Only healthy products. However, the PAUS code doesn't take this into account. So it's a code that is voluntary, as I mentioned before. And this code to be controlled, and it's, of course, it's self-regulated, so it's the companies that control it, the companies in the industry. It's better not to have anything that to, than to have this, because we have the impression that there is a regulation, but there is nothing. You just have the companies that will be auto-regulating themselves, and, of course, they don't comply with what they should comply. And we see that many of the advertising infringements have to do with products that advertise themselves as healthy because they have vitamins and this is data of the Carlos III National Institute on Public Health. So this is a code that doesn't work, but it's been applied since 2005. And we see that most of the healthy products that our children see on television are not healthy. So our children are exposed to advertising that leads them towards a path that it impacts their health. And we see that this advertising addressed to children is growing increasingly, and our goal is for the government to regulate this once and for all, as in other countries, to regulate advertising and to protect our children. And last year, we met with Minister Garzón, and they were positive meetings. And now we have a draft for a decree that we have tried to amend because the idea was to regulate advertising, and it's very much based on the Portuguese decree, but it's true that there is this um, time period between 8 and 10 o'clock in the evening where many children do watch television, so we want 
there to be a greater protection during more hours and we want to prevent advertising around schools, billboards and so on. And we also don't want these food companies to sponsor sports events or other events. So now, after submitting this draft, we're waiting for its approval, but it hasn't been approved yet because there is a lot of pressure from the food industry lobby. So the months go by and, I, and we don't know whether this will be approved or not. What we know is that we have been waiting for this decree for months. It can be a good decree, but there is a very strong barrier because the food industry is not interested in this decree because that would mean that they would have to transform themselves and invest because now the population is starting to understand better what is healthy or unhealthy. So, it's all about politics very often. So, let me summarize what's happening in Spain. We have all these policies by the WHO that are not applied in Spain. Here in Catalonia, we do have a maximum tax for sugar, and there has been a lower consumption of soft drinks, and that is very important, but there's a very small tax, and there's no transformation of of the tax system is not just taxing one product. We're talking about a food system that should be aligned with the health objectives. And this is something that we don't have. And another important aspect that I'm sure you're aware of is the labeling. Now, the EU will revise the labeling of 2011, where the industry won the battle against the consumers. And now we are advocating for a labeling that is at the front of the product and that clarifies where whether a product is healthy or not. And this is working in Finland, in Israel, in Chile, in Mexico, and in Ecuador. If you go to a supermarket and you see a product that has a high sugar content, it will say so here. And what has the food companies invented now in Europe because they know that there'll be a stricter regulation? Well, the Nutri-Score labeling that comes from England. So, most processed products are considered healthy. Here you have an example. This is what's happening in some countries. You have these very clear labeling, but then we have this Nutri-Score, and here you see the difference. It's much easier to understand and it's more effective to have the octagonal label. And the question is, when we've taken this to the health ministry, nobody wants to position themselves because this has an important impact on the industry. In Mexico, they have implemented it because they have a terrible problem with diabetes and children's obesity. So it's important for the public policies to react. And we we know that this octagonal simple labeling is much more effective. And what are we doing, the Nutri score? And we have this study at our website, justiciaalimentaria.com. And here we show how we would label with one system and the other one with Nutri-Score. Here we have the green, red, yellow colors to see what it's good or bad or so-so. For example, pizza, Actimals, real, real. They have an A, a B, a C. So they are all right. Yogurt, soft drinks, refrescos. And this is not a fresh type of diet, and the score is 
Si lo pasamos well, por el tamiz, good. lo que hice, However, que according to the WHO, WHO they don't no really meet no the relevant pues requirements pues because I will explain how Nutri-Score works and it doesn't meet also the requirements of the current Portuguese regulation. So what does Nutri-Score do? It's a gradual system. It's a state-wise system because the, the octagonal label is much more clear in this sense, whereas with Nutri-Score, Score, it says, well, it's bad, no, 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 not too bad, and it's confusing. With the octagonal label, if there is sugar, you have the label of sugar, and it means also if you have that label, you cannot advertise this product on TV. This is what happened in Portugal. Nutri-Score, however, works as an algorithm. So I have a really bad rates in fat, but my rate in sugar is not so bad, so there is an offset, all right? And this is one of the most controversial aspects because it still has a sugar even if you add vitamins. It's as if I took some foie gras that is mainly fat and then I added some vitamins and said that foie gras is healthy when it's not. And this is what the food industry is trying to do. They want to reach this green, yellow type of labeling because they're the most convenient for their interests. Because if not, otherwise, if the processed products, if not processed products wouldn't go through this filter. And it's the same for um, Chile, what I said about the requirements, and here we see these scores for these products that are inconsistent. I also mentioned food tax. We have here a list of countries that are advancing on the concept of food tax, and I don't have much time, so now I am going to focus on a study that is called My First Poison, and it refers to children's food for ages from zero to three. And we discovered that children's food became a great an invention, a great invention for the food industry from the ages of three, zero to three years old. So infant food. So we can also associated with having to be eating specific products, and that's how the industry develops. And this industry is going against what the WHO says, because the WHO says that children need to taste different types of food, and they need to chew, and you shouldn't give them too much sugar. In fact, if our great-grandparents were to eat the food we eat today, they would find it too sweet. And the business, however, of the food industry in our country is very strong. And we have this um, type of food for infants, and this represents a huge market of high, 500 million euros and 60,000 tons of products. So, we're talking about 1.6 million individuals that consume these products. So, there are mainly two companies that have this type of products for infants that Nestle and Ero. And we have to understand that these products for infants are 
have a very high sugar content. And between zero to one year of age, the WHO says that children shouldn't have any sugar whatsoever. However, at four months in our country, a child will have already had 1.5 kilos of sugar. And this has an impact on our children's health because some of these uh, products given to infants have more sugar than a soft drink and it's all based on the hydrolyzed cereal it's a process that uses enzymes so that it's easier to digest but it works as sugar because it has a lot of starch and some of these products say they have no sugar content but on the label at the back you see hydrocarbons and we see that 21 grams are sugar out of 100 grams of hydrocarbons and this should be labeled if not forbidden so that it's clear for parents what they're buying for their children, for infants. But in this country, this is a lot. And for example, here, we see these herbal teas that are given also to children if they have uh, colleagues. And if you give them sugar, however, with this type of product, they won't be able to go to sleep, will they? And bueno, what pues happens a, with formula milk? milk? It's pues the same story altogether. So we have products that are recommended by pediatricians. However, these products are questionable from a health standpoint. And we often have this marketing strategy, for instance, here. For example, this is something we reported to the press. We know, for example, the, the, that the Spanish Pediatrician Association received 2 million, year, 2 million euros in five years for providing their logo to baby products. If I am a parent and I buy a formula for my baby and it's been recommended by the doctor, by the pediatrician and it's sold in the pharmacy, who can think that that product is not healthy? However, it's unhealthy. So this is how dramatic it is. And with baby food, we see that 40% of baby food is water. So the nutritional value is very relative. And many of the milk that are considered like growth milk, well, they don't really have that many good ingredients, but they're more expensive because they are considered like growth types of milk and our children, however, are not protected from all that fat that they're consuming from all these products and they're not protected from all that advertising about these children products. And that's why they have the logo of the Spanish Pediatrician Association instead of having the octagonal label that they use now in Chile to warn against products that are unhealthy. So this is our current battle. We can see who recommends these products, and it's mainly physicians. In fact, I remember when my youngest boy was born in the public healthcare, we received a package with all these products for children with biscuits, so, the products addressed to the children population have a worse nutritional profile than those that are addressed to adults. So, this is the situation we face today. 
Here we have many other examples. I won't bore you with them, but we see all these products that are like my first, this or that that are unhealthy. So we don't have a children's advertising regulation in Spain to differentiate the products that should be advertised or not. And we don't have a conflict of interest law either. That means that the large companies with vested interest in the uh, food industry cannot be in the decision-making process of uh, policies. We see, for example, meat companies uh, teaching uh, uh, at school about the consumption of meat. This makes no sense. So these uh, practices should be abandoned and we should bear in mind that this is already being done in other countries. And the reason why it's not done here is because of the strong lobby of the food industry. And the only way of fighting against this is having the different parents, organizations, and other entities and individuals as well acting to request a change so that we cannot, so we don't lose control over the food we eat. This is a guy that was distributed by the Catalan government in all the schools in Catalonia. They were recommendations uh, for families. One of the recommendations was to have an afternoon snack, and this was sponsored by a chocolate spread called Nocilla. So we see things like this as well for uh, training um, in schools they will tell children that a banana has more sugar than a baby food so these are materials we see all around so it's almost seven o'clock i don't want you to bore you but by way of summary i would say the following it's well explained in this uh, last slide we have to reduce uh, the prevalence of overweight and obesity to prevent the consequences on our health, the BMI should go back to the levels of uh, 30 years ago. And obviously, this has to do with a certain type of companies and we need to them to reformulate their products, but we also need to change our diet. We need to recover the Mediterranean diet. We should be focusing on local produce and this can be done through the public policies and by having citizens claiming and supporting this type of initiatives because I remember that a food company received recently uh, an award to excellence and they are advertising and sponsoring many things. However, it's important to have independent information. It's difficult to reach the population with independent information, but here you can find all the information and healthy food is being becoming an increasingly important topic for the population. And when you buy uh, children products, please do read the labels well and read that information properly. All right, so I will stop now so that we can have some time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. This has been very interesting. We have two questions, and I would also like to ask something. 
The first question is whether this presentation will be shared. This conference has been registered. Uh, sorry, I meant it has been recorded. That's what I meant. So in that way, you will be able to access it. And in this way, you can also share it. There is another question uh, that has que to do with baby food and with uh, growth milk, and it would be important also to look at their ingredients because I'm sure they have a high content of fat and sugar. More or the same as that of traditional agricultural products when we're talking about sometimes organic products. And what can we do as citizens to change this PAUS code so that it becomes an effective regulation? So we have these two questions. I am sure that there will be more. Thank you very much for these questions. All right. The first question, it was referring to organic and non-organic products. You have to remember that organic uh, products, if they are processed, they can be as bad as the non-organic processed product. The fact that a product is organic doesn't mean that it's healthy. Of course, it has less chemicals. But if you eat an organic chocolate that is full of sugar, it's still a product full of sugar. So the organic label doesn't mean that that product is healthy. It means that that product has been produced in a good way, but that doesn't mean that that product is healthy. This is one of the strategies we see in many cases with many companies that do green washing. All right, so there are now new labels, biohealthy labels, climate friendly labels. There are many of them. But these labels, in the same way as Nutri-Score, have been created by the company. So these are not public. And we also want the health care ministry to the health ministry to regulate this because with the current labels the companies can invent new concepts and confuse the consumers with the information so my recommendation is when you go to the supermarket to buy a product, the more labels that product has, the worse it will be. You have to be alert. The more fresh, the fresher a product is, the better. And the WHO has issued a very in, some very interesting guidelines in this regard, in this regard, in the same way as the Catalan Health Department. And in the case of advertising, what can we do as citizens? Well, we need to be active in all the um, campaigns such as the Defend Me campaign, Defend Me. So it's important to put pressure and to disseminate the news. But we're now awaiting that decree and if the decree is not passed, then we would launch a new campaign to request the support from the citizens. Because we started with this in 2005, and we are already in 2022. So, with regard to the draft of this decree, I'd like to ask you if what you want to regulate is advertising on TV and traditional media because we see that young people don't watch TV. They use their mobile to check TikTok, YouTube, 
videos and those of us who are parents and we when we see these videos that our children um, see, we see this uh, product placement, you have a YouTuber and on this YouTuber's desk, there's already product placement because there's a specific product that they are advertising in a very subtle or non-subtle way. Yes, we are very concerned about this because Children don't watch television anymore, particularly teenagers don't watch television anymore. And we have included this aspect also in the last draft. We have referred to influencers and digital media. But TV still has a very strong impact. And in Portugal, they have taken this into account. And there are different time periods that should be considered. And we need to have an entity, a body that can control this and can apply penalties, important penalties. We haven't seen this yet, but it's important to have an entity that controls everything and assesses everything because every year there are new things with digital communication, we see that there are many different aspects that can become loops. The UK was the first country to issue this type of code, but the food companies found a way to skip some of the requirements, so it needed to be amended again. And it's not appropriate, for example, to have sports events that are sponsored by these food companies or to have these logos of certifying bodies that are important medical associations. So it's important, yes, going back to your question, to focus on digital communication because there is a lot of pressure with regard uh, to uh, of food and to the way you look. Now the, the pressure that our children are under is uh, terrible because there are a lot of food disorders nowadays because of what is said about food and in Spain, for example, the consumption of these energy drinks that shouldn't be called energy drinks is legal. And these drinks should be forbidden because they're full of caffeine and sugar. But here the advertising is not even restricted. And we know that there is a very high consumption of these energy drinks among the population below 14 years of age. It's like having 15 cups of coffee per day. Oh my God. But the thing is, if you have this advertising of this drink in a can that's blue, and then it's admitted, and you have to think that these energy drinks are very dangerous for children and youngsters. It should it, it, the consumption of this type of drink by youngsters and by children while they are playing their video games is very, very high. So please, if you have any of those at home, throw them away. And we have a last question that has to do with education, the educational task that we're also developing and that the administration should develop, i.e. education campaigns at schools, for example, Fruit Day. And this seems to work because then you create an environment that has a good influence and a good impact. Are you aware of any other campaigns like this? I think this is key. 
because food and diet are key for our health and we think that there should be a specific subject at schools referring to this topic and then you also have entities such as yours that explain what the truth is about food and a healthy diet because there is no public control on the school canteens. It's considered as an external service and these things need to be corrected. So, food education should be included in the plans, in the study plans of the schools. And this cannot be left in the hands of the food industry because I remember going to a school to give a conference and then on the next day there was a company going to that same school telling the children that they should eat more meat. So, it's very important to educate our children properly. And when you give this type of education to children, they end up even educating their parents. They change the diet at their own homes. They say, I don't want to eat any more fried food or croquettes. And sometimes the families well, tend to always make the same type of food that's not so healthy, and then children are eating healthier at school and they educate their parents at home. And without education, it's impossible to transform society, and food is key for our future. Well, thank you very much, Javier. We will stop here. We have recorded, as I said before, at this conference so that we can share it and disseminate the message. It's very important to do this so that we can have a food system that meets our needs. So stay healthy. See you soon. Thank you.